Here we go, everybody. Hello, internet. Hello, people. Friends and fans, faces new. It's Scott from Ed Video. We're back here on our weekday at 2 p.m. daily live web show called Open Circuit, where we speak with artists each day and talk about what we hope are amazing and interesting things for, for you to hear about and learn about and see. Um, normally my daughter Edie is here today. She's missing the show again. She had some other obligations that she needed to attend to and that's fine. She's a busy kid. Um, we hope everybody who's been watching has been enjoying the show. Uh, today we have a really, really special guest, a dear friend of mine, an artist I have a great amount of admiration for. Her name's Amy Lockhart. She's joining us via Facebook Messenger video chat. She's waiting in the wings to talk to us now. That music you just heard was um, an older track by an act called Live Action Fez. And Live Action Fez is Fez Stenton, who will be joining us tomorrow as the guest. Uh, tomorrow at 2 p.m. talk about his video projects. Um, we, we have a lot of uh, good upcoming uh, episodes for you today. Let's just uh, take a little look at some of the guests that are coming up here on Open Circuit. Uh, as I mentioned, tomorrow, Fest Stenton we will be joining us. Then, uh, Friday, uh, I think we're going to have a, a special surprise show. I'm working on something tonight, and uh, I will announce it tomorrow. But April 27th, Alejandro Garcia Contreras is giving us a tour of his the residency he runs in Chiapas, Mexico. Then, just confirmed last night, uh, April 28th will be special guest Robert Dayton joining us, talking about his music and art and uh, book uh, projects. Uh, we'll talk a, a little bit, I think, about Robert later in the show as he relates to something as uh, involved in, with our today's guest, Amy Lockhart. Then May 1st, Versa from right here in Guelph, Live AV Act, uh, talking about what they do and how they do it. May 4th, Julie Ferranda joining us all the way from Edinburgh, Scotland, where she currently is residing, talking about her artwork. Then May 5th, Dustin Sebra, creator of the Project Isolation video series where he's collecting footage from people uh, just uh, showing what they're up to in these strange times in our world and how they're dealing with uh, what's going on. Uh, and then May 6th, Corey Steckel, artist from right here in Guelph, uh, talking about his various projects, in particular his uh, incredible collage projects that he uh, works on every day of his life so lots of uh lots of great guests um coming up and uh hope everyone is uh, enjoying what we can figure out how to do from our super secret location here in at 404 york road in guelph ontario canada just want to talk a little bit about like the intentions of this show um you know I, i'm kind of a reluctant host i don't really do this uh it's a little nerve-wracking actually to go and speak online every day and know that it's always going to be recorded anything can sort of happen uh <coughs> excuse me you're dealing with a lot of tech i'm just live switching the video and the audio each day um so sorry if there's ever ever a few little blips um you can always comment too if you're watching live in the chat we love that uh you know if, if you notice anything going wrong let me know maybe i'll notice it or if you have any questions for our guests uh type them in and when we when the time is right we'll try to get to any uh questions that you might have in this opportunity to talk to these uh artists um so uh yeah so i hope it i hope it's uh hope it's an enjoyable experience and it's fine if uh, people are not in the mood to watch uh, artists talk about their work and have other things uh, uh on their mind but when they do i'm uh, uh, i'm honored to speak to them and uh, i'm gr uh, grateful that they're willing to share uh, what they do as well so with no further ado let's talk about today's guest um if you uh, Google the term why Amy Lockhart rules, you'll see this article I wrote in 2015 laying it out in more detail. But Amy's an artist, uh, she's an animator, uh, she's a filmmaker, she's also an educator in Chicago. 
Um, she's had a, a lot of involvement with uh, Ed Video over the years since she moved to Guelph. Um, oh, I'd say about close to a little over 10 years ago. Um, she was here for a few years uh, while she was doing her master's at MFA at U of G. Um, and we used to do some great fun shows. Uh, uh, she used to host uh, uh, Amy Lockhart's YouTube parties that were really great. People could select YouTube videos and on two, two screens and it would always uh, kind of devolve into um, a sort of drunken karaoke party, but uh, tons and tons of fun. Um, she's also an honorary lifetime member here and um, she's a very fascinating person who has lots to talk about today and the various things that that she's done in her life. So let's see if we can find her on the, live on the internet. Let's see, I think that's her. Oh, there she is. Hello, Amy. Can you see and hear me? Yes, I can. How's it going? Oh, pretty good. You know what? I gotta just, uh, I just gotta, I'm gonna fade back out. There's a little peek of Amy because Spez's music is still playing in the other tab. And I'll be, oh my goodness, as I said, as I said, anything can can happen here when you're live on the internet. All right, here we go. Let's try that again. A little, uh, oh, I think we're back without Fez's oh. music. And you are back. How are you doing, Amy? I'm doing pretty good. Yeah? Yeah, where, yeah. where are you and what are you, what are you up to? I'm in Chicago. Uh, I work here teaching at a school and right now I'm trying to fix uh, my web baby scrib website because uh, it won't load and I feel like I didn't pay something but I can't remember but um, so I'm teaching classes and working on some drawings and on a film with uh, some puppet ducks and drawings and stuff like that and hanging out in my apartment that's awesome yeah. you're doing okay then you're feeling good you're staying I'm, busy yeah doing good um, I'm a natural hermit loner, so it's a good, so it's good, you know. People are avoiding each other on the sidewalk, just how I like it, <laughs> you know. Crossing the street to get away from me, it's great. That's I'm just joking. Sorry, I shouldn't be joking about it, but what else can you do? Well, you know, comedy and tragedy are closely linked, and uh, sometimes it's yeah. just a natural reaction to uh, joke around to deal with uh, things that, as a defense mechanism. Um, let's talk about, let's get right into it. I, I think you're like a, a really unique artist. I always have thought that even since before I met you. Um, I feel like you create uh, work like from a really special place like in your soul um, that often I frankly don't al always see with artists. Uh, the, uh, it, just, it just seems like really authentic and really like of you. Uh, can you tell us, uh, I'd like to ask some of our guests this, like what are your early experiences with art from your childhood? Do you have memories that can maybe uh, pushed you into thinking you might pursue it or take it seriously? Yeah, I was, uh, I was like uh, one of the kids in elementary school that was uh, good at drawing, you know, so I draw things for people, like that sort of thing. And uh, yeah, I, I just spent a lot of time alone. I was very shy. So I always had just like big imagination world and then um and what else when yeah and then in high school and stuff like that yeah it would just got me through a lot and it was a really great meditative space and i feel like I, I can't even get to that space anymore sometimes a little bit but you know like this that amazing like zone out escape from the world making art sort of thing right. so yeah well, uh, let's get right into it, showing us, our viewers uh, some of your work uh, so we uh, can talk about uh -oh. it. Um, I wanted to start with uh, kind of an older video of yours. Uh, uh, it's called Miss Edmonton Teen Burger. Uh, it's from 2002, and uh, we're, we're going to show like an excerpt of it, just I think like the first uh, two or three minutes to give our viewers a, a flavor of it, and then we'll come back and we'll chat about it. Okay, sounds good. <coughs> All right. <coughs>
Oh, Nancy, just please help me. Tell me, Nancy, what am I going to do? Oh, my God, I'm going to kill myself, Nancy. Oh, my life. I used to be so famous in a distant land called Edmonton. Oh, God, when I was a young star in Edmonton, my girlfriend Carrie on this side and Dawn on this side, we ruled the streets of Edmonton. We were West Edmonton mob. Now my friends, Carrie Ann and Dawn, won't even come to visit me. Baby now that I'm just stuck in this fire. house all by myself with that annoying little baby. She doesn't want anything. Oh, baby she's a big loser. Fire. I should just have an abortion. Squeezing out that ugly baby was just gross. And now she's not even winning anything. Now she just took everything I have to get it back. I mean to be on top again. Oh God, Nancy, help me. Help me. What am I gonna do? Oh my God, Nancy, no, help me. No, no, Nancy, help me. No, no. I, oh, oh, my God. You're real, Nancy, you're real. You're real. Get yourself together. Miss Edmonton Teenburger, remember who you are, 
take, I'll just change the story, and, and then Miss Teenberg will be like locked in the closet for the rest of the time. Yeah. Wow. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to ask you sort of about the style, like the aesthetic of it. How, I'm, I'm very curious, like how much of that is uh, by design, and how much of that is just from your ten dollar budget. Uh, you know, by uh, the equipment okay. you had uh, access to. I think it, it was half and half. Um, it was half and a half and a lot of it was budget like I had no budget it was filmed in my apartment in only two rooms like the like many of the scenes I just redecorated and stuff like that um, a lot of the decorations I just found in the garbage I lived in an apartment building um, so outside that someone just loved all these like Christmas decorations and stuff like that uh, and then we just made them and again like Matthew's like a amazing scene seamstress, seam person, designer, clothing designer, <laughs> and good at sewing, yeah. So he uh, he made a lot of it. And the baby's costume, like the baby's costume, that was from drawings I did of babies, with like, the, so it was like based off of that. What else? Oh yeah, and it was, I had no idea what I was doing. I, I always did animation. I'd never done anything really that narrative that needed to make sense. Um, so and then I added in funny parts, like they, they call on the phone all the time. Like, and then he answers, she, and Miss Edmonton team Mary answers the phone and announces what's happening in the story because I was worried maybe people wouldn't know. <laughs> so I'd be like, there's a party happening! And then, you know, it's yeah. um, So uh, let's, let's just talk a little bit right now about, like, this, I don't know, like, the, this kind of overarching weirdness to all of your work that I find uh, so amazing. Like, uh, how... What, why do you think, do you, I think my theory of it is that there's a thirst that people have for things that are like this, like uh, way outside of the traditional conventions, really kind of challenging, I suppose, to figure out what's going on, a little bit chaotic, a little bit uh, uh, vulgar, you know, like what, how, how do you, what kind of reactions do you get? Because, I mean, there's something, I think, established in the tone of this that kind of carries through to some of the other work we'll be taking a look at today. That's funny. I don't even, I feel like there's not that much of a thirst for it. To tell you, maybe some people, like, I, like I, so some people who find it will be really grateful, you know what I mean? But um, I always joke that I make, like, my work is cult classic like that's the medium I work in because <laughs> it's like uh, hard for a lot of people but then I'll have like some people that really like it um but yeah but work like I think it's work like this is important it's like oh it makes me think of uh Berthold Brecht Brechtian you know all that business but um but just I think people like stuff that that crosses over taboos and also like breaks the the bullshit veneer off of everything and and rather than making like feel good stuff where everyone feels good at the end and we can all feel you know smug and good because we watched like the good movie together and now we can go home and like eat all of our gasoline or you know what i mean like do all the shit we're still doing and it's like destroying everything but um so i think people like when when that kind of bullshit is smashed or, or there's like something that like you know crosses puritanical values and all that bullshit you know i think it's taboo but then it's also like somehow it's refreshing I agree. And like, I mean, uh, having curated your work a few times, I think people are r like far more open minded to it than maybe even you even think or you're admitting to. Uh, I think that people love it. And uh, it's like a breath of fresh air when everything else is so like set in its little boxes and, uh, you know, pretty easy to follow along and figure out like it's sort of uh, what good art should be where you're meeting the viewer halfway. Mm hmm. Um, uh, let's, Thank you. Well, you're you're welcome. Uh, uh, <laughs> let, let's talk a little bit now about some of your uh, some of your drawing work, which is also a huge part of your practice. I'm just going to take a look at uh, uh, maybe two oh, yeah. two drawings here that uh, I still have files from where we showed at the uh, supermarket art fair in 2014. I think these little uh, super cute little Caspery androgynous oh, character. Please. Yeah. Um, do you, what, what's, uh, what, tell, tell us a little bit, I guess, like, I mean, drawing is sort of maybe the backbone of, uh, some of the stuff you do, and we're going to take a look at some of your books, uh, soon, but tell us about how you think about drawing or what, why you decide to sit down and draw instead of animate or make videos. Oh, yeah. Um, I think draw, drawing is just like, an, it's like, uh, almost 
coming up the part of the making process where you're coming up with the story or your world or even looser than that you're like world building and just like you know characters and things and how they can connect and and stuff like that and you can you can like explore and all that bullshit <laughs> but uh but and that's why i like it it's really nice and it's loose and and um and stuff like that and then yeah, an- animation is different. You, it's like you get to draw with movement. Uh, you get to engage with like um, language of mass media. For me, a bit more like editing. That's what I'm interested in, uh, editing and stuff like that. Um, yeah, and then animation. It, then I start to nerd out on like either tech stuff, which for most of my projects, I like to make them more difficult by introducing a new software or something like that. But um, but it's really fun to nerd out on that, and then also get really like methodical about um, planning it out, as methodical as I can get about planning it out and stuff like that. Well, let's talk about I guess when it does get planned out or put into sort of a <laughs> a, a cohesive form. I'm I'm just gonna use my little camera here to show a little bit of uh, some of your books. The first one I want to to show is the beautiful little book from maybe about four years ago called uh, Looking Inward. Okay. It's a smaller uh, book. Um, uh, came out right before we did a show in London. Um, I guess uh, 2016 maybe. Um, so, I mean, this this really awesome little book, uh, you know, it's just drawings in it. Like, it's, you know, I guess one of the frames of references might be sort of like comic book, but certainly not in that traditional form, more like an art book. I mean, how do you think of this when you sort of make a collection of uh, work for a book? Great question, Scott. <laughs> Just joking. But it, um, <clears throat> so when I make books, how I started making them with zines and stuff like that. So I started making like fo- on photocopiers, mixing color photocopy and black and white photocopy. Um, but mostly I would just collect my drawings and I, I always, now I am better at sketchbooks, but when I started out, I was really horrible at them. Um, I would draw one thing and I wouldn't like it and then I would never want to like see the book again and stuff like that. So I would draw on loose pieces of paper and have just like boxes full of these drawings. So then these books became this way of collecting them and almost being like a show or like I could put them to bed after that and then, you know, distribute them and have them out there and I'm like a reference to look at. And I would just take the drawings and then on the photocopier, now I would do it on Photoshop, but I would just like go on a photocopier and shrink them and cut them out and glue them together and make the little mock-ups. Um, oh yeah, and then my book. So a lot of my work is um, influenced by mass media. Like that's the, um, uh, what I grew up on as a kid you were talking about, you know, it was like watching a lot of TV, escaping to TV. That was my world, like the, like my sense, I have sentimental connections to it. Um, you know stuff like that. So, so I like to use the modes of creation that are associated with mass media, like print, uh, screens, stuff like that, and also mess with the language and type different types of narrative and stuff like that. So, um, those books are often, you know, like half a comic, half a drawing, or like you know, and mostly the drawings are just like weird. They just have like a weird vibe to them of the relationship between the characters, but there's no text or anything. So yeah. Wow, very cool. Um, uh, let's let's talk about a more recent book uh, that does have text and like a story involved oh, yeah. in it. Your amazing hard hardcover book, uh, Ditch Life. It just came out like four or five months ago. Um, tell, whoops, tell a, tell us a, our viewers a little bit about Ditch Life and how it came to be. Yeah, here I'm just. Uh... <laughs> I'm, I'm just getting the book. So Ditch Life was is a comic. I just I, I was supposed to do a book tour, um, right? But like uh, starting March twentieth, and then it just got canceled. So I've been doing these talks, but uh, this is my spiel. So Ditch Life is a uh, comic about a woman's search for meaning, which is a lot like Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning, but different. Um, and then, so this is the book. It's hardcover, published by Fanographics Underground Press. So it's like their um, smaller print run releases. Um, super. Okay, I just have to unplug my phone. I might die. But um, I'm gonna switch to this. Sorry. No worries. Technical difficulties. We just, we just um, roll with it here. So yeah. So super grateful to have them publish it. It started out as this one story here, Puppy Love. It's just about sort of like um, 
dynamics of a relationship and just like games people play sort of thing. Um, and then it just c continues on where there's like maggots and pizza boxes and action and I forget what the cost the, oh yeah you just want me to tell you about this oh fuck yeah here's a read through so you can buy it online from Fanographics $30 there's also a board game somewhere in here there's maggots What's oh yeah uh Plastic surgery. Okay, wait. Oh, yeah, and then this is the really fun part that I was so excited they could do was that this um, this one section here is actually a pull-out uh, board game. Oh, yeah. So super fun, and then you can... Um, it actually works. Someone was like, oh, my God, that's hilarious. You did a board game. I was like, you didn't play it? Like, I, it's based on a six-sided die, six options, and then you advance the next six options. Come on, people. But, um, but so, this, so all of these are kind of based off of uh, self-examination and, and experiences and being a fake therapist and analyzing stuff and, like, and that. And this was based off of, like, sort of um, working with people or working with, with someone and, and I was just trying to retell the story and I realized I couldn't tell it um, properly because it was so much about like weird power games and stuff like that so then I ended up turning it into a board game and that's the story wow. oh yeah and then there's these um, ducks and stuff like this yeah. but uh, I can't believe they actually were able to do oh this is a spoiler I'm going to the end I just can't believe they were able to put the board game in there, which is really cool. <laughs> More boobs. Lots of boobs. Always boobs. Why not? People love them, Why not? apparently. It's yeah. for children and adults. <laughs> Well, let's talk. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about something else that has a bit of boobs showing. It's uh, <laughs> some of your sculptural work. Uh, this one I saw at um, where was it? It was at Kafka uh, about a year or two, about a year, year and a half ago in Kitchener. It's called uh, Jessica, isn't it? Jessica, yeah. the sculpture. Yeah. Uh, it was just captivating because. Uh, uh, you did that trick where the eyes sort of seem to oh, follow yeah. you around no matter where you are. I mean, tell us a little bit about when you have a character, for example, and it seems to be the right one to make it into a 3D instead of a 2D object. What would what would push you to do that? Oh, that was, yeah. I think it's usually, yeah, if I just want to recreate the character. that I did, how many busts did I do? I think I just did three, and then... Yeah, that was the one. Uh, I was also for my MFA thesis, so it was building up the show, you know. Um, so it was just uh, doing a sculpture technique that I had done before. Um, but but yeah, I, th I just love the idea too. I think it might be from uh, watching a lot of older TV with uh, like what's a puff and stuff, you know, stuff like that. Like those shows where they had like so much texture that it felt like you could like smell them. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like those olden days. Um, so, so that makes me want to just sort of like take these flat worlds and make them physical and that sort of thing. And just, and there's something like just interesting about it. It's just like, it's funny. It's, it's ridiculous. Like just to make paper versions of things. I don't know. Yeah. Card cardboard busts. Well, let's uh, let's keep jumping along. There's so much to talk about. What I really want to focus on is some of uh, some of your animation work that uh, people really love that you've made over uh, some time now, and the, and in different styles to show uh, different techniques, I suppose that you uh, have for making uh, animations. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, this uh, this video that I just rip everyone's videos from YouTube for this, uh, so I just use what I can find. And uh, this one is uh, um, from 2009, I suppose. I guess you made it in collaboration with uh, Mark Bell, and it's called The Collagist. Let's take a look at it in full, and we'll come back with Amy Lockhart, and we'll talk about uh, some of her animation works.
Well, there we had uh, the collages from 2009. And uh, what I'd like to talk about is sort of that cutout technique uh, for animating that you use and why, uh, why maybe that's like a really natural bridge from drawing to animating, why it's practical to do and maybe why, why you do that. Um, so I started out making learning animation uh, at the Atlantic, Atlantic Filmmakers Co-op in Halifax, Nova Scotia with Helen Hill, who taught me how to make animation on a 60 millimeter film. So um, it was making uh, directly onto film that needed to be processed. So you couldn't see what you were doing. You couldn't redo anything, um, that sort of thing. And um, you had to make all like the original work. Like if you were going to do cell at like hand drawn animation, you would have, you know what I mean? Like it was a lot of work. So cutouts became this really easy um, way to learn animation, which isn't drawing, but, but is movement. You know what I mean? So, so it doesn't matter what you're actually moving around, what you, you know, animation is the talking through the movement. So, so it just became a lot easier to sort of like engage with that. And, and like with animation, it's a lot of, um, the fat, it's things are change incrementally. The bigger the space between something, the faster it moves. The smaller the space, the slower. So, so it's a lot about like slowing things down and, and making them go faster and sort of getting into the the zone of it. So it was a lot easier to do with um, with cutouts rather than laborious drawings that are like a lot more about they take longer. The lot more, more about thinking. So that's how it got started. And then um, digital stuff became more accessible to me. Uh, and then with the collages, that was uh, made at the CESA, California State Summer School for the Arts, that's held at CalArts that was taught by uh, Trixie Sweet Vittles. Um, and we both went there for like a residency and we, and he does, at the time he was doing like draw, he does known for comics, a lot for comics, but also does uh, drawing and collage and was like more doing that more then. So um, I ended up uh, doing like a recreation of him making a collage we made all the bits together and then i made his hands and all of his tools and stuff like that and then made that one oh yeah and then that one i just did on uh like a sony handy cam with uh point using like frame fee for something like that like a really early like i stop motion type thing um and then after that oh yeah and then i did some compositing like filming and then erasing it out and overlaying it um, but then that sort of like bridged my work into um, basically doing like multiplayer and under the camera cutout stuff, but doing it digitally. Like so, the, the same sort of idea of moving stuff and you know incrementally. Yeah. Well, it, se it uh, seems seems to make sense. We're just watching um, a little bit while you're speaking of your Jessica animation, also made in the same style. Oh, yeah. um, I think in a in a minute we're gonna look at. Um, something uh, different about that's uh, I guess entirely made I suppose on uh, computers uh, in particular the uh, Amiga computer kind of a obsolete uh, uh, machine from Commodore I believe if I remember correctly and uh, but still useful to animate with do you want to talk about how you got involved with it was it through that Trinity Square video yeah um, Maddie Pilar um, from Toronto she um, she put that together she is a mover and a shaker um, also a filmmaker. Uh, so she put that together with James Patterson. I know he wrote an essay for it. And yeah, like Trinity Square Video. There were, I'm sure there were lots of people involved. Uh, founders, someone with the first name P. Uh, but anyway, so they put it together almost like a conference. Um, Petman, Petman Foundation. There you go. Oh, yeah. uh, so, so they put together a conference, invited like five uh, different people that work in like uh, animation and video. Uh, and then we were all uh, asked to just use either a Commodore 64 with the with Amiga on it that they had at, at Taste, Toronto Animated Images Society, or else um, use an Amiga emulator, which is what I ended up doing. And then you can actually get a program. There's like a big community around it. It was one of the first commercial um, animation programs. So there's like cult following and history. Um, so they actually made recreate an operating system so you can pretend you're using a Commodore and then you pretend you're using like D paint, you know, or M music D paint is like the animation program. You like look, pretend to like load your floppies in. It's, it's just going through the whole like uh, interface sort of thing. So yeah, so, so I did it with that with a bunch of other people. Yeah. 
Well, let's take a uh, let's let's take a look at uh, that that uh, video, uh, Henry's kittens. Uh, oh, it's not sure, it's yeah. not too long, and I just want to make sure we play it with the sound because it's uh, yeah. it's a pretty vital uh, part of it. And we'll be right back with Amy Lockhart talking about her animation and then some of her uh, more recent projects. All right, that was uh, Henry's Kittens from 2014, made with uh, an Amiga computer, uh, digi completely digitally animated. Um, uh, uh, what, uh, what? <laughs> so, yeah, what? there's a good story. Okay, so that story, I was in, I was in LA, uh, and then I was hanging out with my friends, uh, Trixie and Paul and Lisey and the Wallers and all those guys, and then Trixie's like, oh my God, Henry Waller. <laughs> Lisey's nephew. Too many details. Uh, this she was basically like uh, me. Got me and this kid Henry Waller, who's my friend, who's awesome. Uh, when he was like seven or something like that, and he told me his this dream or vision he had, um, and then I animated it for him for him. So I was like, and it was fun because I was like, okay, tell me what you want. I pretended I worked for him and stuff like that. And I was like, is this storyboard good? Do you have any notes? <laughs> stuff like that. It was really, it was cute. So he had a, he basically had a vision. That was his vision, like. My mom's boobs turned into um, slippers, and then and then cats came. Oh no, cats came out of my mom's boobs, and then her boobs turned into slippers. I think it was something like that. Yeah, but it was pretty much like, you know, line for line. I, I illustrated that vision, that child's vision <laughs> for that one. Well, one thing I think is amazing about your animation and some other animators is that they can tell like this like short like scenario story it kind of breaks out of the conventions of narrative uh, where it's like this you know arc storyline there's tension it could just be, sort of be like a glimpse of an idea or a short like an idea like a short like a scenario or something i think part of it might be it takes generally it takes a really long time to animate but it's also um uh, I find it like a very charming um, format to show something like that, just like a scene. Um, mm. some, do you like think a about, moment. Yeah, like a moment. Do you think about yeah. that for, for your work and, uh, you know, like how you yeah. think differently than like shot video or longer format work? I think, of, yeah, it's nicer and it's freer and it feels like you don't have to take people on as long of a ride so you don't have to give them as much satisfaction sort of thing. But um I never thought about it that much before. I just sort of did it. And then once I started teaching, I realized so much is like trying to convince people that film and animation isn't about a story or an idea, but about like these moments that happen and this tone you set sort of thing. And I feel like it took like when you're coming up with a story, you have like this great backstory and like, oh, and this is and this is all related and this is going to happen. But it's like what's important is like just that specific moment, almost like a memory, like what was the lighting like? How big was the hand in your memory? <laughs> you know, like stuff like that. Like like you're just creating a moment to get a, a feeling. So I think I, yeah, I think I like that. And, and shorts are great because, um, yeah, they lack the pressure of the, the longer one, but you can also create many varied moments and not just different types of tones but also like different techniques and visual languages and stuff like that you know mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's talk about sort of like creating a, like a world or an atmosphere that you have like mm -hmm. total control over. Uh, what we're going to look at now is uh, one of your most recent projects, uh, the infamous Baby's Crib uh, project. We'll take a look. Uh, there's a, an animation you made to, as like a promo video, really, to promote the website <laughs> and sell T-shirts. Um, it has a little a bit, a bit of. Uh, of Did uh, somebody say T-shirts? Somebody. Oh, look at look at that. T-shirts for sale, twenty dollars. Oh my sell goodness. All sizes, pretty much still available, maybe except for. Me. <laughs> <laughs> we have a double commercial here for baby's yeah. crib. That's baby, with three S's in the middle between between baby and crib. Baby's crib. Yeah. Um, and you can also see all of the a lot of this stuff right on Amy's website, amylockhart.ca. But tell us a bit about the kernel of the idea for Baby's Crib. Very funny and seems to live uh, comfortably on the internet. Yeah. Um, man. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Baby's Crib. So I started making an animation with Devin Flynn, who did the uh, Y'all So Stupid, Y'all So Stupid back in the day, which is really great. Um, so we started working on an animation together that was commissioned by Super Deluxe. And then it was 2D Flash. Um, animation and it was really fun. We got to make this world up. All of our characters are in it. Um, and then uh, I just got inspired to sort of like work on this website and uh, and just like that weird one, like that just the fetish, the the compulsion to like uh, turn two D stuff into three D stuff. And just I love um, vinyl and latex masks and stuff like that. So. So uh, I thought I would make live action versions of them, like real life uh, versions of the characters. And then I was just going to do photos, but I was like, oh, the photos could be photoshopped, blah, blah, blah. Anyways, I decided to make videos. I decided to use the format of the free cam girls sort of set up and then just uh, researched a bunch, of, a bunch of those, which are great because especially if you look at a really off time, it's like you're just looking at people from all over the world in their like weird little worlds and it's just it's kind of great when you get the you can find some oddballs or, or real balls on there not real balls uh -huh. um but anyway so i use that uh that aesthetic and then also streaming and stuff like that and how things slow down and speed up and it messes with sound uh so i uh, made uh, made costumes for all the characters, uh, filmed them with Tony Visconti, uh, who also did the animation on them, uh, and made these really trippy, like, want too long, too slow uh, videos that are like fake webcam girl videos, and you can go to the website, and there's a little chat panel, and you can chat with them, and, and it, they'll chat back. It's like randomized chat, but it's all done in the in the... Uh, language and the context and backing up the narrative and all that stuff from the animation. Um, yeah, and the website also has different inside jokes from the animation. So and it's and the website is supposed to exist as like um, a fake website for the bar that's in the animation. So it's the bar in the animation is very trashy. So the website's very trashy, that sort of thing. And yeah, and then why why I was really compelled to work on this too was that. Um, I just like the idea of world building and narrative through different platforms. Um, I'm just watching like a lot of uh, makeup tutorial drama on YouTube and stuff like that. And, and then there'll be videos like people will fight who give me make makeup tutorials and fight on different platforms, Snapchat, Twitter, YouTube, stuff like that. And then there'll be other people that will collect all this evidence and then put it together for you so you can understand what's going on. But it's just interesting how it's like, you know, they've screen capped something and there's this like multi rhizomatic or whatever um, sort of like story world. So um, I just like that idea and like the idea of just using those aesthetics. And I did some stuff on Instagram, too. So, yeah. Do you get any uh, kind of surprising responses, some sort of randoms on the internet who maybe get it or don't get it or try to I interact? I wish. I think maybe, maybe when it was on, uh, when it was on, uh, like, Instagram, I would get more messages. I got some good random ones, yeah. A lot of people just, uh, it's just such a marketplace. You know, it's like, follow me, I'll follow you back. Or, you know what I mean? Like, it's, it's like, um... A, lo a lot of it was just spam like uh, like a lot the followers are real but you would you know what i mean like you'd get like it was just like uh, engaging with that that stuff too we're like oh yeah this is just we're just fucking selling ourselves oh my god what's a good hashtag uh you know 
<laughs> right. So, yeah. so where did the, I, I mean, where did, for you, I've, this is kind of what I'm trying to get to, is like, where did these worlds come from, like, in your mind? I'm, I'm always fascinated by artists, like, where, you know, where's, where's the source? Like, I know everyone's inspired by things and whatnot, but when I see, see an artist who's, like, you know, really, yeah. really unique, uh, like you, really, like, uh, taking chances, trying new things, like, they're sort of outside of very traditional conventions of, of, of things, like, um, you know, what's driving that? What's, where's it coming from? I'm fascinated by, by ideas like that. Mm -hmm. My joke answers are spite and uh, barren womb. <laughs> I'm just joking. But, uh, no, but spite in some ways, like, I think that's what motivated me a lot in a weird way. It's like feeling like I had something to prove because I um, went to, you know, I learned animation through film co-ops and stuff like that. Um, and then also I just had the, like, the, victim mentality or you know like out, saw identified as an outsider to things and stuff like that so part of that was just the excitement of being able to cross over into into other places that I shouldn't be allowed in or stuff like that or just be able to like find ways to get my work out without having to have maybe a traditional show in a gallery or, or like that kind of thing um and then what was it oh yeah and then it just gives me purpose to like um in a sense, uh, but it does a lot. Like, I just really like working on projects and it's just like fun. And I love the, when you, when I can engage with that really creative part of me and, and get in that zone and, and think of ideas and yeah, just like world build. It's just, um, just really fun. And then just to, to keep challenging myself to not just like try out different techniques, but to, to be really honest with myself when writing stories or just be on, you know, like it, it's a way of, self-examination and transformation and all of that stuff helps with all that stuff so it's fun to just keep trying to push that you know and make new different stuff well uh, the other th thing i'm very interested in is for you like you know there's an interesting collision i think between your different worlds um between you know comic stuff from animation stuff from video th things and like straight up contemporary visual art um like objects like how does that sort of mix in with uh with the standardized kind of professionalized gallery system and contemporary art like do you feel like you're kind of like sneaking in or um do you do you find that maybe when you do things that are a little more unusual that like people are just ready to respond to it i guess that's my re my feeling is like uh it's open and um uh, people are interested in kind of a more alternative things. They, they're they also interested in contemporary art, but maybe they're not seeing that so much. Do, how did, in your mind, at uh, least yeah. in your experience, how did those worlds overlap? Well, my world, I, I would say I probably hang out in like the comics <clears throat> and animation world and weirdo world, like the stuff that I look at rather than say the art world so much, even though it's, give me a show, help me. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, but, so, what was the question? How does my work trans, translate into there? Um, so I feel like it makes sense. And again, I, it's just like my peculiar, peculiar compulsion and satisfaction in doing my weird thing to, to spite like the common and traditional ways of disseminating work sort of thing. So it's really fun for me to look at systems and not think of how I can like, win a, at a system so on uh, maybe an unfair system or whatever so much you know like his you know networking and all that stuff like that my ego is too whatever or i'm just too proud or i don't know like it, it just doesn't like it interests me but it interests me to find a way to get around it or to like subvert it or i think it's also just maybe my sense of humor and wanting not being able to take myself or anything that seriously like it's it's um so I just, I just, it's hard for me to take authority like that seriously, or like the pretenses of the art world like that seriously. Um, but yeah, <laughs> yeah, but it, but it's fun. It, and, and just different things like uh, comics and that's it. It's all other ecosystem and stuff like that. So, um, so yeah. And then that, that's when I think I relate to that more. And I often, now, now I sort of just start, started uh, referring to my drawings as merchandise and all my art as merch. So, because I like to just think of it more, it's like you, you just go table or you just have a show and you sell and whoever comes buys it. You know what I mean? Like um, more just uh, base and trashy, I guess. The end. <laughs> I like the base and trashy a lot. I, I think it's, uh, you know, 
from, we're about the same age and there was that was a big part of it in the 90s and beyond and before them from maybe the 60s or 70s to the 90s and it kind of got lost a little bit yeah um so i find it like almost nostalgic and i find it like alive uh whereas you know you're you're a teacher and i find a lot of young artists today and i get it because they're nervous um about choosing a career in art but they're a lot of their work seems a bit sanitized like it was made to impress their uh, professors or fit you know as the next logical piece into the yeah. system that they're trying to ingratiate themselves into um, uh, and I mean I think there's a little bit of evidence of that in our the most recent thing that we worked on together um, at the material art fair in Mexico City which you know has started out as this uh, about seven years ago it's like a showcase of that kind of wild side of the art and as art fairs and other organizations do get a little over professionalized and we went in uh, with your work uh, with Robert Dayton's work and Beth Frey's work uh, and tried to do something a little different and you know people really responded to it we'll take a little we'll take a little bit of a peek at some of these pictures uh, I'm just gonna show them right off of Instagram for our viewers here but uh, you know for you like uh, how, how do you think about that like do you feel like an oddball or do you feel like uh, there's still like a lot of place for for this sort of stuff i guess there's place for it i i do feel like a bit of an oddball i, I think it's also just like film animation world too can be a little bit um conservative like a, like the film festival world and a bit more um yeah almost more conservative in a weird way and more old-fashioned than than um the art world definitely and then uh it doesn't like it just like, equates, uh, you know, it's just very like, I'm not explaining, kind of like just bougie, <laughs> bougie values of like quality and comfort and craftsmanship and stuff like that, which is all good, but you know, but um, but like no, like um, stuff that is interrogates the medium or is disconcerting is seen as like bad, either not done on purpose or else just like not like you know just you know bad basically so um so it feels like and and then there's um yeah just funny yeah, and then there, there's just uh yeah in art there's like a ni nicer freedom with like embracing mass media or embracing trash aesthetics maybe a bit more um and then art well do i feel yeah i just think it's fun to to, to sort of float around and find different ways and oh yeah, that's what I was thinking. Um, when you were talking about the material art fair, it just makes me think of like scenes. And you know, like a, a scene will start out, and it'll be like, think back to your youth days, and then it'll be um, really interesting and alive. You know what I mean? And then it just kind of gets co-opted, you know, um, and then it becomes dead, and then you have to start something else. So I feel like, uh, for me, maybe that's the excitement of, of actually genuinely wanting to be something, part of something that's alive instead of falsely being part of something that's like high status. You know what I mean? That you know isn't real because it's kind of rigged and, you know, like that kind of bullshit. So, so I think that's what I really crave is those, those moments and that finding different ways to engage with art and art mediums and stuff like that. That's like for me finding different scenes and stuff like that, that like, you know, that yet eventually <laughs> die off or get ruined <laughs> like material art fair material art fair is amazing i think it's great i mean, i wasn't there the first years but i was there this year and it was amazing well i mean i think it's a great example of sort of where these things clash and i think you and i both sort of have uh you know a toe at each side of it and sort of this outsider uh more punk rock anarchist style of things and but also like in in part of the kind of official uh um, art world too let's talk a little bit like sort of about the official art world and you know I mean th things have changed pretty dramatically since uh, we were in Mexico just two months ago but it sort of seems like a whole other world now um, I keep thinking a lot about like well you know what what is this coronavirus pandemic going to do to that world it's hard to prophesize perhaps but I mean uh, I kind of feel like maybe some of these things um, you know, it's obviously going to change a lot for a long time. Um, do you, what do you think might be like, uh, you know, when the world kind of comes out of this slowly in whichever way it's able to, you know, what parts do you think might die off and which parts do you think might um, find a, a new life? And if you if you want to look into your crystal ball and tell me about oh, yeah. uh, the truth. What do I think? So it'll be so no matter what, like people are invested in the art world, so they're going to prop it up. 
you know so i think but then i guess the low economy will be less less art will be being bought and less um you know like the fringes get cut off the extra stuff gets cut off so there's just less and it might make it more interesting where um people do stuff more on their own and um don't get government assistance or or like start their own spaces and stuff like that um which can can be really cool and because it's less regulated in a way and stuff like that um i feel like i, I don't know I, I think there'll just be more virtual stuff you know what i mean like more performances and i and one of the part of the art world is like people buy art but a lot of it is just like buying the experience you know what i mean or buying like when the artist becomes like the dancing bar bear sort of thing you know like buying the the myth, the myth or the bullshit, you know, like that kind of thing. So I think um, that that curated experience might be the my people might try to find how to like commodify that on the internet or whatever, you know what I mean? Just find a way to do it in some other way. But um, but yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. Yeah. yeah. But that, that's and then yeah, I guess a lot of festivals are going online, which seems good. It seems like they should do that all the time, kind of. But you well, pay a little pass. Oddly, I mean, I started doing this show. This is, uh, uh, I think, our 13th, Lucky 13 episode, so uh, two and a half weeks ago. And I mean, I'm just trying to do something, I suppose, because everything's off the table uh, for the future. Even things that we're trying to postpone, we don't even know for sure if it's going to work in the fall or a year from now. We'll just, no one knows yet. We're waiting for basically uh, science uh, to let us know what's up with art. Um, so one thing one debate i keep seeing bandied about in different articles is this idea that uh online stuff is subpar and that you know that could be true if you're thinking of it entirely about how it's a substitution for in real life activities you know um and and i also appreciate that a lot of people just don't want to try to uh, switch to doing things online but you're very you're pretty invested in the internet and i think you're s suave about how to understand it like how how can the internet kind of fill some role um, for for the lack of in real life things and also like wh how do you think artists should use the internet um, a little bit better even beyond when this pandemic is over? I think it's it's what it's making good connections and and it feels like deeper connections when you're talking to people that you know now on the internet and stuff like that. So it would be nice to think that people in different places could connect more and like digitally and stuff like that. Um, I, I wonder if people will become more attached to objects after, or they'll become fetishized. But I feel like for screens, like I look, even when I look at art, I look at it on, on screens usually, mm -hmm. you know, it's rare that I'll, I'll go and, and look at the actual thing, which is great. I love objects. I love paper. Well, I don't know if I like objects and paper, but, but there's something, I like paper. It's something nice. Yeah. But, um, uh yeah so so i think it's it's i think it's just kind of going that way with screens and it's like if if you've been brought up since you were a kid looking at stuff on screens why would you oh my god i remember i was at this uh installation for baby scrib at austin austin texas contrast film festival lex bon, um and best sita did it uh so anyways this baby this baby scrib thing and i was there giving out flyers and then there was like 20 something someone in their 20s and they were like i don't want paper i don't do paper and i was like oh just take it leave it somewhere and they're like no i don't do paper and i was like this is amazing like what? like i don't know it's kind of great so i think people are over younger people might be a bit over paper i think paper is like a it's just gonna be like a fetish thing who knows maybe the power will go out maybe we'll go back to the paper uh that's don't even please don't even joke about the power and the internet going oh, out my goodness uh we'd have to yeah. we'd be so lost in our own thoughts and in the present it'd be difficult to I deal know, with nightmare. ourselves uh, <laughs> yeah i know where would all my family and tv families go yeah <laughs> But I just want to uh, let's just uh, wind it down. Now. I just wonder if you have any sort of like last thoughts or uh, hopes or things that you could tell us about that you are working towards. Uh, um, or any oh, advice? Yeah. Advice. Um, I would say, like, um, focus on the positive. As cheesy as that says, that sounds, and focus on how people are helping, and you can help out even if it's just like donating to a food bank or making food calls or some, or making phone calls or something like that. Uh, 
because it's just it's just too much i feel like it's like such a petty pandemic and people are getting uh there's just this perversion in our culture with news where it's like this rubbernecking and and like um, always these scandalous, sinister headlines and stuff like that. And I feel like it's just not good to get it, uh, to make people in a good place so that they help each other, that sort of thing. And it's, and it's like, we can, like, this is a horrible obstacle, but we could actually join together. And, and communities are like my community. There's an organization that I'm like helping out with. Um, and like people are coming together to like help each other out. And it could be this opportunity for a really good thing sort of thing. So, yeah. Well, I hope so. So, anyways, but so I would just say, like, focus on that stuff, and uh, yeah, and like, as fun as it is to to watch um, America implode, like, there's good people here, and you know, yeah, have some empathy too. <laughs> I think it's a, a it's a really great time to have empathy and sympathy. I know I found a lot more in my in myself, I suppose. Um, where some things I wasn't that into, suddenly I see a new value in it. Um, trying to trying to broaden my the way I think about arts and culture and just life overall, and uh, to try to be more patient. I think I'm hoping and uh, more understanding um, in ways like that. So I just want to say thank you so much for taking the time to speak yeah. to us today. Um, show us a bit of, around your studio and talk uh, about your art. It's very generous of you to share your ideas about it and let me uh, let a video stream some of your work here too. Um, so um, thanks so much, Amy, and uh, looking forward to when uh, we can see each other in real life again, whenever that is, when you're back totally. in Canada. Totally. Yeah, say hi to Jen and Edie, and I hope she continues her fight against Petco. <laughs> it's pet smart pet 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 smart she's pet really smart, pet she, not so smart. she calls yeah. it pet dumb and pet dumb yeah waging a email war with the with pet pet dumb ceo about their inhumane practice of uh, selling betta fish from cops yeah, yeah. <laughs> Love well, it. And she made a documentary series, didn't she? She did make a she did make a uh, animation yeah. actually, uh, a stop motion animation about her feelings and in the, in the for propaganda to spread her idea. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> okay, thank you Scott. You're awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll see you. Me. I'll see you again. Okay, see you. Bye. Take care. All right. That was uh, an interview with artist animator um, bookmaker, educator, Amy Lockhart, who is joining us from her studio in Chicago, Illinois, um, telling us all about her work. Uh, um, hoping that our viewers that logged in live and those who see this uh, video later enjoyed that. Um, thanks so much. I know some of Amy's fans were watching, and uh, I think Amy should have uh, more, more fans than she does uh, in this world because she's a, an amazing and a very original and unique artist uh, whose, whose work has a lot of uh, life in it. And I think right now we need art with life in it. Um, we're going to be back here on Ed Video's Open Circuit um, each weekday at 2 p.m. on Ed Video Guelph, all one words, YouTube channel. Just learning a little more each day about how to do this, um, figuring out the backside of YouTube and trying to... Um, arm wrestle it to do what I want it to do to, to make this program possible each day. We have some great guests coming up. Uh, join us tomorrow. Uh, one of our, our guests is going to be Fez Stenton, who um, I'm going to use one of his tracks from his live action Fez um, album from maybe seven years ago uh, to play out the show. Uh, take care, everybody. Be safe. Thank you so much for watching. And have have fun if you can. Well, if you're still watching, I can't get the uh, audio to feed through on my laptop at this time.
That's okay. We'll try again tomorrow when we're back actually with Fez. Thanks again to Amy Lockhart joining us today. Everyone at home on the internet, um, Tess and Doug and Jesse, Barry DuPay is joining us all the way from Vancouver. I miss you, Barry. Love to have you on the show sometime if you want to talk about your videos. Thanks so much and take care, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow with Fez.